Well, welcome everybody. We are here for a year in review CISO talk special episode looking at 2023 and maybe the interesting and maybe the wild and wacky or, you know, things that really kind of struck us, hmm, didn't like that, love that, et cetera. We'll, we'll find out. This is just going to go where it goes. This is not scripted. We're just going to have kind of a freewheeling uh, road trip looking back in the rearview mirror. So JJ, <laughs> always good to be doing this with you. Um, yes. it's fantastic. It's, Sorry. I, we're, <laughs> <laughs> you guys, we have so much fun when we record stuff and we, we try to be serious before we come on, but it doesn't actually work that way. So hi. Welcome. So introduce our guests, if you will, JJ. All right. Um, sitting in the blue corner, we have Mr. <laughs> Dan Glass <laughs> and opposite. Now that makes it sound like you two are fighting. It's definitely not a fight here, but it, but it is fun to watch you two in action together. It's been several years. <laughs> Allison Miller, of course. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks. Great to have you. Uh, So, so Dan, I know you're charged with a few things you want to talk about. So let's, let's have you kick things off. 2023. I I have nothing. I have nothing. (laughs) A blank slate at this point. (laughs) Jody's going to shoot me from wherever she is. Um, No. So, you know, starting off, I think when I think of 2023, um, I think of generative AI, right? It, it started late last year, about a year ago. Um, but really, this year is where the businesses start to wrap their arms around it um, and, and starting to push these use cases. Um, the way I see it from a security perspective is if crypto and cloud had a baby, it would be generative AI because you got the, uh, you, you've got the hype of crypto, uh, but you've also got some of the utility of cloud. And I see it ending up about the same as cloud is is sort of a detente. Like from a, a cloud perspective, yes, we've we've gotten rid of data centers, but we've replaced all that cost with cloud costs because cloud ain't cheap, um, whether it's SaaS, uh, PaaS, or IaaS. Uh, so I'll I'll pause to to let Allison uh, correct me how how wrong I am on everything. No, not at all. I think that's a good take. It's just that you forgot like the soap opera level drama of um, social media sort of in that mix along with the hype of crypto and the the promise of cloud. <laughs> um, I, it really did crowd out all other conversations that I feel like folks wanted to have, you know, um, we're making advancements from the technology perspective on a number of fronts, a lot of things happening with the economy, <laughs> but every single conversation either started or ended talking about generative AI for me this year. Just being a perfect example, starting with generative yeah. AI. <laughs> you know, the, another word that, that kind of goes with that for me, Dan, is co-pilot. Everybody's got a co-pilot. Now we've got you know, it isn't just bots or what chat bots or whatever. It's every product is introducing Gen AI and Gen AI as a co-pilot kind of assistant to their product. So I'm not sure what the next evolution is, but pretty soon I'll have my co-pilot talk. Yeah, to I don't know. Co-pilot so immediately solve it. You said that word. Um, <laughs> um, uh, you made Dan twitchy. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> so hit a nerve there. Well, so, so, and, and, uh, Probably gonna get in trouble for this, uh, but I'm gonna do it anyway. All right. So uh, the the way so so Copilot is an interesting thing that Microsoft has put together. I, I think they're you know they're all in approach is bold. I'll I'll say that. Um, but but what what I'm amused by is is that they're still in the they they've sort of launched it and they they but they launched it without really understanding I think how to a sell it. And B, how to market it because they've already changed the name like a few times on at least on us corporate guys. Uh, you know, so we're chasing uh, at first, you know, Bing Enterprise, and now it's Copilot. For I'm so so confused by their SKUs and and what they're trying to actually do. So I think uh, Microsoft first of all needs to pick a name and stick with it. It seems like it's Copilot. I hope it is. Um, but then also uh, understand why guys like me get nervous when they say things like, oh, yeah, no, it's no problem. We'll just use SharePoint as your enterprise knowledge repository. And oh, oh, oh there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, so <laughs> yeah. so that, you know, that can bring up another like thing that will probably be what we talk about in 2024, which is data hygiene. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, and, Dan, can we can can I jump in? Can we bump down the requirement for naming from a and replace that with something that works because the little bit of um 
anecdata I've seen from friends using Copilot in uh, larger organizations that are piloting is that it like completely destroys the file that you're operating in to the point that you can't even save the file, save as the file, manipulate the file, or even copy pieces of the file sometimes out into another file that it's, it is not baked and it is what's be what's before bleeding edge. Like there's gotta be something that's just like a complete mangled mess. That's what it feels like still. Absolutely. Robot on a rampage. (laughs) I think it's chaos theory. Texas, you know, (laughs) AI chainsaw massacre. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. I've not heard that about a co-pilot. And and I do, but I, but in all seriousness, I mean, I think there is some risk here because generative AI is not perfect and uh, hallucinations are real. Um, Adversarial prompting is real. Uh, Prompt injection is real. And I'm not saying Microsoft hasn't thought about these things, but I don't think there's good answers for any of it. Bias is real. And, you know, and and the technology hasn't caught up yet, right? I need, I'm going to need, I believe, a generative AI tool or an AI-backed tool to counter the risks posed by AI and generative mm-hmm. AI. And mm-hmm. those tools don't really exist yet. Um, not in a way, shape, or form that I want to invest in, right? Um, because that, if I just use it as the native tool, like, how does that even work? And and do I got to go now hire a bunch of prompt engineers and security? Is, is that money well spent? I, I don't even know at this point. So, yeah, I, I think Microsoft isn't really doing enterprises a lot of favors uh, by pushing this out as quickly as they are. Well, Dan, you're kind of giving me a flashback back to 2022, 2020, 2022. That sounds really weird to say. But anyway, I sort of forgotten what I had been thinking about a lot in in 2022. And that was data governance um, and IAM. (laughs) And I feel like these are things that are like all that's old is new again. It's an evergreen problem. No one actually ever nails it down. And with cloud and with some of the cool data technologies that have been introduced in the past five to 10 years, Folks are sort of rewriting the rules and the complexity of folks' data stacks and their um, need to like manage access across all of these systems and stacks is just ever increasing. And so in a lot of ways, um, what the, the problem set that we're seeing with generative AI, it might have been a little more tolerable if we'd had things already solved (laughs) on what seems like a simpler problem, which is like basic data governance. Um, So it was really kind of like adding fire to some, a slow burn, (laughs) a slow burn. IAM and data governance, those are slow burn problems, but they're problems that, um, you know, desperately need attention in most enterprises and just trying to add in something, you know, sparkling and new like Gen AI on top of that. Definitely most folks aren't in a position to be successful there. I'm thinking about data governance and management in the context of training data going into LLMs, right? This is a whole mm-hmm. new yes. use and your IP is in that. And you can, you're, are hackers better off stealing your LLM instead of your database, right? Because maybe it's trained in unique, interesting ways, has information that you can't get anywhere else. But how do you also, how do you manage the flow of how those AI systems get updated as part of or in synchronous or not with your software cycles, your security plans, all of that. A lot more questions than answers, I think, introduced by by 2023. Ironic. <laughs> yeah. The year of the more questions, please. Yeah. I think Allison nailed it, though. Um, you know, it's we're, we're we haven't finished blocking and tackling from a security or most enterprises. I'm sure there's people out there that'll raise their hand and say, we absolutely have all that nailed. And, um, and, and some companies may, um, you know, and some companies are doing zero trust well and um, good for them. But, but I think, you know, if you're, if you're going to pull the market, I, I think most mark, most companies are probably very mature. Security is usually running to catch up. It's a lot of bolt on stuff. And that's expensive when, as Allison was alluding to, it's a lot, it, it would be, time consuming and a little cost prohibitive in the beginning to do some of that data governance and data cleanup and and maintenance and and get that rhythm going. But on the long term, you're probably going to save money on security, especially because you're reducing your risk, right? If the data doesn't exist anymore because you cleaned it up and and you're sure about who has access to it, um, you know, you've gotten, you've plugged a lot of holes just by doing some boring stuff. But unfortunately, 
it is boring. It doesn't drive revenue for the uh, for our friends in, in vendor land, uh, you know, and so <laughs> it, it, that's kind of a cheap shot, I guess. But at the same time, those are but those are real problems that, you know, they always say what problems are CISOs facing. And, and we're like, yeah, well, well, we're still having trouble, like getting IT to patch. And you're, and you're coming here with this, you know, this this great way of doing this, you know, really corner case security issue. Right. For, you know, to reduce risk. And it's like, yeah, but I, I got this other thing. Help me there. Um, so. Great. Uh, Allison, is, is something, anything you want to throw on the, you know, the log in the fire of 2023 as we're looking back and warming up going to 2024? Um, well, I'll just sort of, uh, so my work has taken me, uh, I still work on enterprise cybersecurity issues, um, like, you know, like CISOs do, but I have also been spending a lot of time recently looking at what I would call sort of advanced product security issues, things that are happening in the product um, that folks are offering. Um, and sometimes that shows up as like anti-fraud, anti-spam, um, anti-abuse. Um, and uh, I think what's really interesting is so having kind of worked in that space for a while, most platforms and like these are things that affect pretty much any consumer facing platforms. Like if you have a login button or a checkout flow, you're dealing with some of these products or sorry, some of these issues in your product. Even if the product is working as intended, these these problems tend to show up on your doorstep. And um, it's interesting to see cybersecurity vendors who have classically been focused on selling into the enterprise now sort of picking up some material or trying to help out in the product. It's really just kind of interesting watching some of that convergence. So one of the things that has been a problem for many years for anyone with a login button is account hijacking, right? Like phishing happens and what happens, someone's credentials get stolen and their account gets hijacked. So we've known about account hijacking for a long time. Um, and a lot of uh, companies have built their own tools. They've added things into authentication. They have their own sort of detection technologies. And if you're a consumer of any technology, you sort of experience what the what two FA looks like and um, recovery codes and all of those things. But now we see enterprise cybersecurity vendors who are experts in authentication <laughs> leaning into, well, I can help you not just with getting your employees to log in to your internal systems, but also help your customers logging in to your platform. And we've seen um, some detection vendors that uh, maybe they were selling device ID for some reason, sort of shifting over into, well, maybe you could use this in your product to, to notice that bad actors are coming back or bots are coming at you or what have you. And so it's been really interesting for me to sort of see the entry into a niche, I guess, of, uh, of vendors who'd been typically sort of selling into uh, corporate IT. It's just fun too, because uh, it's, where, it's where this side, where those consumers live or where things like scams and e-crime live. So it's kind of a fun place to hang out. And it's interesting to then see those names that we know and love um, who are we're working with to secure our enterprises also show up and, and offer to help out in these um, more fun places. I'm trying to, I'm wrapping my head around this. Um... And, and and trying to uh, regurgitate this back to you without using any vendor names because I don't I don't even know who's doing this in this space, right? Um, but let me let me ask this: <clears throat> uh, Would these types of solutions, if this is successful and, and goes down a good path, um, would they help protect against some of the consumer facing issues we've had? Like like recently, twenty three and Me had had an issue, but it was credential stuffing by users who had poor password hygiene, not something that, you know, 23 yeah. and me had control over. Is that right. where you see this kind of playing and using those analytics and intelligence on the consumer? Yeah. I mean, even the, like, uh, so I feel like credential stuffing, those, that's like an authentication sort of expert kind of way of describing the problem. The result is an account hijacking or a compromised account. And so um, there are, you know, there are folks who are looking to, hey, notice that and that there are bots 
coming to your API. Maybe they're coming to your API because they want to bid on Taylor Swift tickets <laughs> um, or like stuff, jam up the queues so that no one else can get Taylor Swift tickets. Or maybe they are trying to take over your accounts um, and in order to pull information out. So yes, it, w what we're talking about is vendors who have been working on other use cases, now working on use cases that are consumer facing consumer or customer facing it could be a business doesn't have to be a consumer but customer facing customer affecting yeah and okay. sometimes those use cases sometimes those use cases are like owned by the the security team but sometimes they're owned by a product team right mm -hmm. that that has their own way of thinking about business objectives and such so it's a really interesting bridge set of use cases for getting these teams talking to each other too <laughs> That's interesting because I did when I saw that, you know, and, and it's it's easy to go, OK, well, that wasn't their fault. Um, user. But wouldn't you notice that many user accounts being accessed at the same time and some pattern? Right. There's some pattern that's off of baseline from that. I saw Dan raising his hand. So I don't know if that was a well, I'm no, trying was, to buy Taylor Swift yeah, tickets I or saying, I have something to say. And Allison <laughs> has a line on how to get uh, Taylor Swift tickets. Then she got me a. A note. Yes. Well, um, I think, yeah, there's. <laughs> so, uh, but no, from an enterprise perspective, JJ, you're touching on something that, so we depend on our, our vendors, our partners uh, for a lot of our security apparatus. Um, and so, yes, we absolutely uh, have set some stuff up. Like I know that I have my team set things up. So to monitor for, you know, too many logins from the same IP, or too many of the same, or or more than you know, more than one IP logging in as a person, right? You know, the, both use cases, impossible travel, things like that. Um, but we also rely. Let, let's say you're a Microsoft partner, um, you don't get you don't get insight a lot of the times, or you have to pay for advanced logging and things like that in order to get access to the fact that that you know maybe you maybe you're being password sprayed, where they'll you know, which is sort of the inverse of credential stuffing, right? Where you know they'll they'll send a password with a bunch of user IDs instead of a user ID with a bunch of passwords, right? It, um, but but we need to be alerted about that, right? And, and in some cases, because of that that separation between the if the product people don't think enterprise, they just build the product. Now there's that lagging indicator, right? And this this goes beyond just AAA for enterprise security buying a security product. This would go for almost any triple you know any platform where you don't have SSO in place, where it's not an SSO um, uh, login. It may be just a standalone login for you know something that maybe you're doing some sort of LDAP push or whatever. Um, same, same idea, right? We, we need to know, and, and sometimes the enterprise security just isn't you know, on top of it. Right, and JJ, someone definitely will notice if someone's looking, <laughs> if someone's looking and when they pushed the change into production, they made a decision to log <laughs> certain types of information. And so there's the, the there's sort of a, um, I, I think I'm not sure I'm not when Dan says the product folks need to be thinking enterprise. Um, I, I think that that is true. Um, but there is a, it, there's a mindset thing there that doesn't necessarily come naturally. It, it needs to be something that is sort of developed in an organization. And, you know, I think we're, past the point where every product was an MVP, you know, where like now we have apps that have been around for 10 years. They've had folks who've been working on their security and such, but there was a time when, you know, there was an app for everything and everyone was just putting their information in. And a lot of these folks, they didn't have time to develop some of the, um, well, I shouldn't say they didn't have time. They they did not take the time <laughs> to develop past the this app works <laughs> yeah. into this app works is effective, safe. I can troubleshoot it. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be a security issue. A lot of things, um, you know, you need to log that data and be looking at it to keep the app or the system up <laughs> yeah. um, to keep it on. So. I think that um, we're we're moving to a point where that's becoming clearer. 
And, um, you know, we have a lot of great platforms that have been investing in this stuff for years um, and have security best practices wired into how they develop, um, you know, products, not just from an application security perspective, but like how the products work and what the user experiences with the security issues. Um, and that's kind of new. <laughs> I, I, and I love to hear it. So, th- I mean, you know, hearing you makes me hopeful for the future. Um, it, true. I mean, it needs to be table stakes for for some of these apps, right? Um, and not just for enterprise. I'm, you know, I use apps personally, and I would like not like my stuff stolen there either. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think better security, just making it making security more of a functional requirement and less of a non functional requirement. Because non functional requirements, I think, uh, Allison, you were getting at is they sort of fall to the floor, right? You know, ship the feature, ship the feature, right? Right, right. So uh, is that an intention that we're going to set for 2024? We're going to manifest this better (laughs) product (laughs) security for consumers, better security experiences. It's like, just like. Security becomes a feature. (laughs) I'm visualizing it in my head. So hopefully we can, we can make it so in 2024. We should get back together at the end of 2024. Put it on your vision board, everybody. Just put it on there. Put it on the vision board for sure. So speaking, it's kind of changing, shifting topics a little bit. JJ, something we've talked over and over different times is the evolving role of the CISO, you know, what what folks on our panel are doing. And, uh, you know, I think there was a great disturbance in the force when Tim Brown got charged by the SEC you know, for the things happening at solar wind and you can examine all the reasons why, but, you know, Dan have heard from you, probably Allison, same for you. What, what JJ, I'd love you first to comment on what you think the impact of that potential risk or outcome for CISOs, like going to jail kind of thing or being heavily fined. What's yeah. that going to do? Is anybody going to want to be a CISO anymore? Well, <laughs> It's funny and timely, I guess, to have the conversation. I mean, I think also people like anybody listening, um, if you haven't taken the time to understand the the nuances and the difference between this and some of the stuff that happened before where people were abusing bug bounty programs, uh, intentionally hiding um, breaches and and, and doing some some shady stuff, right? Um, That other stuff is not not appropriate. Uh, and, and we're not saying that's OK, but this this um, this happening with the SEC where they're basically punishing the CISO who has no authority on execution at a, at a certain level up the organization. Um, it's timely. I, mean, I hate it, but it's timely because we just had this conversation with Andy Ellis um, before this happened when we were kind of talking about the, you know, the conversation of the CISO who's in the room, who's invited to the boardroom. What does that uh, composition look like of those executive leaderships? Um, and I think he was pretty blunt about, you know, the the role of the CISO um, and how they are treated by those stakeholders and that they're not always invited to the table. And then sometimes if you if you are invited in, you still might get told what you are and are not reporting and your report might be filtered before it gets up up the chain. And so, I mean, it's a pretty shitty place to be as a CISO. It's one of the, you know, it's one of the many reasons looking looking into that life that I don't do that work as a CISO full time because there's pieces of CISO stuff that I like. So I like advising CISOs and doing the parts that I do well, and then leaving the crap of the things that I don't do well and this stuff to other people. But I think that. I think the fallout from this is there are a lot of professionals who are doing a great job that, you know, don't get paid enough to deal with this kind of risk. They're not protected by the corporate policies. If they don't have that type of cover from that, those stakeholders and leadership, they're just screwed. So we're going to lose good people. You're going to get the wrong people into the into those roles. And I don't mean like a blanket statement, 100%, but it's going to be hard to recruit into these when the CISO is not given the authority that's in alignment with the responsibility that they have. No, I think, I mean, I think um, obviously some of the recent cases, and we've, we have a couple now where uh, CISO is called out. It's definitely making a little people... J- folks um jumpy because 
what's the up, what's the, what's the, <laughs> what's your risk tolerance? And I think that a lot of folks who end up in a CISO seat, um, they're, they're great at security. They're not necessarily um, prepared to, for how their role changes when they get the C. So, um, and the thing is, is that there is nothing magical or protective about the C. You can be a CISO, that can be your official title, and you could still be not part of the C-suite. Um, you could not be covered by DNO insurance. Um, and these are things that we as professionals don't necessarily have practice when we are, you know, I'll speak for myself. When I land a job that I'm really excited about, I'm just so excited. I'm so excited that we picked each other, you know? And so then when it comes to negotiating, you know, now I feel like I need to have an attorney run things through. I need to make sure that there's appropriate insurance in place. And if I was, if I was VP of product, <laughs> um, I don't need to, I don't need to like pony up that level. It's just a sort of more of a compensation and scope negotiation. These elements aren't part of that negotiation. And if you're a VP of security and you're sort of considered the exec and you're, the buck's going to stop with you, then you do need to be thinking about those things. And most of us just simply haven't been prepared by our careers for that. Um, the other thing that I think is a shock to most people is folks who become CISOs are very effective doers. They may have a strategic mindset, vision, the communication skills, and all of that, but we got where we got, and a lot of us sort of get personal esteem out of our ability to execute and our sort of our tech chops, right? Like whatever your expertise is. And some of folks are like the risk nerds and some of us are, you know, the networking gurus, et cetera. But like the role really changes when you are an executive, that's your primary job to be an executive, to advocate for your budget and to like work with legal and work with HR in a very different way than you know, what, how we, what was, what's the phrase, like how, um, the way that you got here isn't where, how you're going to get where you're going kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Like how, yeah. how you, how you got here won't get you there. Yes. And yeah. so I just, um, I feel like, um, uh, the, the individual situations that we have as examples, there's some lessons to be learned, do this, don't do that. But I think, um, especially, as what I'm seeing is that the role of the CISO is actually becoming more fluid, not less like a CISO who also runs IT, <laughs> you know, yeah. or a CISO who also runs fraud or trust and safety. Like the it's, it's not a predictable scope. And yet I feel like some of the expectations coming on to us are a little bit fixed and rigid. And so I, I just, um, I hope for us as a community that we can, kind of um, start to figure out amongst ourselves what the reasonable expectations are and figure out how to advocate for ourselves to get the, the scope, the budget, the, the legal protection that we need. So for example, <laughs> all of you folks who are about to be offered a CISO gig, like you may need your own independent professional liability insurance. Um, you cannot depend on the company to even know what to do as far as getting you covered with the no insurance. So um, that is my 2.5 cents. All right, baby face, what you got? <laughs> she got nothing. She's, she, she covered all my points. Damn it. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> but no, it's true. Like if you're if you are an existing um, chief information security officer or thereabouts, right, from a title perspective, and you don't have DNO insurance, get it. Um, go, you, you know, and 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 go to your board. If if your like leadership says no, then let the board know that you're not covered. And if the board says no, then go look for a new job. Go find another company because uh, you're exactly the type of person that they're probably going to try to throw under a bus. Um, you know, we are. I think so. I'm of, of a split mind here. On one hand, I do understand what the SEC is attempting to do by by doing this. Right, they're they're trying to uh, say that the CISO is is a director or officer. Right, we are a material uh, person in the company. You know what our decisions should matter. Um, but I think they're going out of the wrong way by by going after the person who 
was in a position of having to make those hard choices as a CISO about, you know, your leader tells you, I don't want to hear that. And it's like, well, okay, but I, I need to go to the board. No, you're absolutely not going to take that to the board. And I'm just, I'm not saying that happened in this case. I'm just saying that it can happen. Um, and then the pressure that you're under, right? Because you want to keep your job, your professional integrity. And now do you want to be subject to a, a potential uh, indictment, right? Or, or, uh, or be sued. So I, I think not just the Dino insurance, but, but I think this is going to be a maturity point for the CISO as, as, as Allison was, uh, getting out before, you know, we're, we have gone through maturity cycles where the CISO was usually the smart geek in the room that just knew how to run the firewall and some antivirus. And so, you know, they, they got the hat. Um, and then it transformed into, a, a you know, the, a pseudo risk leader, but still kept at a managerial type level and not a true executive. And, um, you know, so no real decision-making authority, but they, you know, they, they got a cool title. Um, and now I think what the SEC is attempting to do is lift the lift this position up to being a direct of the CEO in almost every company. You know, th this needs to be sitting as a peer to the CIO. If the CISO is reporting to the CIO, now you have a conflict of interest inherent into the position and your insurance carrier may not want to cover you because of, of that position. Right. Th those are things I'm going to start challenging insurance carriers when I meet with underwriters uh, about like how are you know. How are you guys thinking about this? Because I know that if I were covering the CISO, I would want that person to have the loudest voice with the most direct line to the board as possible. Otherwise, you know, solar winds is going to keep happening. Um, and, and I, you know, and I, I, I'm not knocking what happened there. Like I said, I could completely put myself in that in those shoes. Like we've all been there. Anybody who sat in the chair knows the pressure that you're under, not just from the bad guys. In fact, I often joke saying, I prefer that. I enjoy when things are hitting the fan from a security <laughs> perspective. That's my net, like Allison said, that's my natural operating environment, right? The more chaotic and messy, the the more I'm I'm digging in and 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 geeking out and and you know thriving on the adrenaline. But yeah, the 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 managerial pressure, the leadership pressure, um, and the pressure from the other executives to just get out of the way, right? Why are you stopping this? Um, it, it's intense and, and it takes a, an iron backbone. It really does. It's so maybe hard. there is a, there is an upside to this, which is it will help. And I, you know, frankly, hadn't even thought about that, that it will help restructure and elevate that, that role a little bit. I am so mesmerized by the spinny things behind you, Dan. It's, Sorry, it's if you see, if you, see, if you, see, if you guys watch my eyes gla gloss over here, I'm just, I've got sucked into We're the portal. We're hypnotized now. <laughs> okay, last topic. I think you have, JJ. We have just a few minutes left. Oh. If you want to bring up, um, I think we were talking about um, some bad guys getting better. Oh, me? Yeah. You, remember, you yeah. want to bring that topic to, to the front here? Yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I'm curious, and I'll, I'll um, start with Dan on this one, but I think we've, you know, for, I don't know, forever, you know, we're still doing the 101 level stuff poorly. Um, from a hygiene and security perspective, but it does seem that looking back throughout this year, we've had a lot of more sophisticated attacks where it wasn't just, it, now, there were opportunities for us to thwart, but we would have had, to, we we had to, you know, do that thing where we got a bunch of stuff right. Um, and the attacker, you know, instead of only getting right once, they they actually got had to jump through and get several things right. So it feels more sophisticated. So I'm curious your thoughts on, on that from where you sit. Absolutely. Um, and so, so the bad guys, and we're going to, I'm going to use that term generically, but, you know, organized criminal actor groups, um, you know, if you're, if, if you go listen to the FBI or I can't even remember what they call organized it. Organized criminal actor groups. Yeah. I just made that up. Isn't that, isn't that cool? Okay. That's, hold on. I need to trademark that one too. I got a lot of stuff. Uh, um, OCAGs. No. OCAGs? <laughs> so they, yeah. they are, um, I think that what we're seeing now is convergence of technical expertise um, and the profit motive sort of mixing. Whereas before it was, you know, you throw, you throw a fish out and you get lucky once in a while. And then we got better fish protection. And then we got better, you know, in the firewalls and next gen and, and, you know, we, we, we have 
satisfied most of the low level stuff, right? So all that was left is APT level attacks for a large enterprise that's investing in security, obviously. Um, and so now what we've seen is that the that some of these criminal groups that are just purely motivated by profit, um, taking APT like uh, capability, right? So they know how your infrastructure works. They know how to manage a firewall or a proxy. They know how to manipulate Active Directory. They know the thing. They know your infrastructure maybe better than you do. Uh, you know, and that is a scary thought, right? And, and they're also not afraid to use non-traditional attack methods, right? The getting back to you know, they're calling people up on the phone and impersonating somebody or just threatening them, right? Saying you know. And ransomware, right? Don't let's not forget ransomware. Um, and just purely for profit. Um, I know nothing about this situation from the inside. I know nothing about their security capabilities, but I look at Bally's and I feel horrible for for whoever was in seat on that on on those days. And I'm sure they're still cleaning up, right? Because I'm sure that they had a good program. I mean, it's Bally's, right? I'm I'm assuming that they had some investment there, right? Casinos take security pretty seriously. Um, and still the bad things that can happen, right? And it, it, that, that, that was a warning shot for, you know, once again, that, that perked me up when I saw that and how devastating, because they didn't care. They, they just went after them and they set a ransom and they didn't pay the ransom. And, you know, it, you know, like I said, I, I feel horrible. Like it, 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 it's like one of those nightmare scenarios. It's like, you know, we did the right thing. We didn't pay the ransom. And now I just, you know, our, our company is offline for three months. And we have no way of recouping some of the data because the backups failed or or they timed out or whatever. And the bad guys are getting that good now. And it's uh, once again, you know, getting back to that last one about DNO and all the rest of it. Right. Even though we do everything right, sometimes bad things happen. And will the SEC care? I don't know. Maybe. Now I'm depressed. So I think that's that's that. And the 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 example you used was interesting because I think um, so. I, I've spent a lot of my career dealing with actors who are primarily financially motivated. Like there's APTs out there too, state sponsored, all of that. But like, yeah, they're a little bit predictable. They're going after the money and they'll, they'll take the easiest route to go there. And so part of what, like, I'm kind of rolling around in my head is these folks have always had like, They've been very clever and have supply chains. I'm thinking back to the days of call shops, which probably doesn't resonate in the U.S., but in like Europe and Latin America, when long distance calling was very expensive, there were folks who would figure out how to um, hack phone systems and get free time on the phone. And then like there would be a line, um, you know, <laughs> be in, like Brooklyn and there would be a line at a pay phone with people waiting to, you know, pay cheap rates to call um, internationally and or like it, out the door of a tabac in some like in France or something. And 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 so there then there were deep supply chains associated with these. And I kind of wonder if um, sort of a combination of the success of ransomware plus um, the pandemic because the sort of crime involved crime evolved in really interesting ways during the pandemic, um, both because everybody is at home and remote and also, um, you know, jobs were scarce. So uh, I think in the in the U.S. and maybe Canada, I'm not sure where else check fraud is exploding. But part of what. Um, you know, folks are sort of blaming that on us. It was a just it was a, just a great way to commit fraud. And all it required was like <laughs> hacking U.S. postal <laughs> or what have you, like pulling things out of people's mailboxes, which is very old school. But like now I like figuring out how to break into mailboxes that had multiple tenants associated with it is it feels like very low level crime. But the impact has been really um, big and difficult to get arms around. And so I just, cause you're talking about ransomware. And one of the things I was thinking is one of the things I loved about crypto is that there, there were ways to trace people through the cryptocurrencies <laughs> and, and, um, and, and take action. And, uh, but I, I think that folks are really, the, the, there's innovators who are highly financially motivated and they're, they're going to figure out how to get their money out. So I, I think we'll continue to see that 
because um, it's kind of a shame that um, checks being stolen out of the mail is like a you know a lowest common denominator, but in other situations, hacking a <laughs> hacking a hospitality firm might be the easiest way to get to all of that money. So it's just interesting because they will go wherever it's easiest for them to go. I think that actually you're touching on exactly the point I was making, you know, so they used to go after a company, you know, you work for a company that had a lot of money sitting in virtual currency and that they would go after. And I work for a company that had a lot of virtual currency as well. And, and, and so we were obviously very tuned to those things. What I'm, what I guess what I'm getting at is like the Bally's thing. Yeah. They have a ton of money, but that's not what they went after. They just went after the infrastructure, right? They didn't go after the credit cards. That data might be tokenized at this point, useless to them. So what did they go after? (laughs) Extortion. (laughs) So my, my question for you guys, because I don't think I'm calling this the, uh, year view mirror session, but I don't think we can look back at this year and not talk about zero trust. So in the quick, a, a one word, zero trust in the past year, is it hot or hype? Allison, start with you. I'm sorry. I know you want a one word answer, but like I decline <laughs> to respond if we're to one word. I just, I honestly have to say like, uh, I, I, I haven't heard that many discussions about zero trust this year in the, in the sense that I think the hypiness of zero trust is maybe two or three years old, right? Like it was very hypey a few years ago, but now I think it's just folks are, they they're on their roadmap. They're adopting the principles they can they they can at the pace that they can, and so the, they're still shooting for the promise of zero trust. But I think um, you know, in their implementations, they are wherever they are. So I think it's it's not so hot. It's it's not hot or hype. It's just happening. Oh. I got another I, word for I, you. That's about 101 word answers. So that was really so, good. So I, right. I, I would follow the rules <laughs> and say and say hot. Um only but but in reality I agree with uh Ali a lot. Um because it, we it's a journey, A, but B, it's an architecture, right? So so getting those zero trust principles in place as an architecture and then putting tooling behind it is really what zero trust should have been about the whole time, but it turned into just, you know, Hey, we're selling zero trust. It's like, no, it's like saying, you know, I'll I'll use DLP as another example of yet another term that was an architecture, uh, but turned into a product that then didn't work the way anybody thought it did because of course it can't. So anyway. Thanks for that. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, Uh, Mitch. I know we were right at time there, but um, let's see what happens in uh, 2024. We could have taken the rest of 2023 wrapping it up, but (laughs) thanks to all of you, Allison and Dan, of course, JJ, it's been a pleasure working with you in 2023 on CISO Talk. So thanks to everybody who joined us. Thanks to all of our panel and and my partner, JJ. And we look forward to seeing you in 2024. Let's hope some of these things we're going to like deal with or maybe not and work on the next thing that's more important. So we'll see what happens. Thanks for joining us on CISO Talk. We'll look forward to uh, seeing you again in 2024 on the next episode. Bye, everybody. (laughs) 